So one of the things in the previous discussions has been the emphasis that uh, aggregate demand, uh, whether it comes from injections of aggregate purchasing power, whether it comes from the private sector, the public sector, or the foreign sector, can affect the level of output and employment, therefore, uh, and can also affect the profit rate and the rate of growth. Why is that important? Because from the classical argument, the rate of growth is driven by the profitability net of the interest rate. But if aggregate demand injections can affect the profitability, it can affect the growth rate, leaving aside even any effects on the interest rate. It can affect the growth rate. Secondly, a given growth rate implies uh, a, a log of the output at a certain on a log-log scale, output is a straight line for any given growth rate. Because on a log-log scale, on a log-linear scale, time on the horizontal axis, the log of output on the vertical axis, a growth path is uh, equivalent to a slope of a line. So a given growth path implies a particular slope. For that same reason, you can't tell the level from knowledge of the growth path. Because all lines with same slope will have the same growth path, but they will have different levels of output and employment. Now this is just an algebraic issue, but it's very important from a classical point of view because the pumping up of an economy can move you to a higher growth path. Even without changing the growth rate, it can move you to a higher level, and that's the Keynesian question. What's the level? And as we develop that last time, you can see that the level then becomes something that depends on the path taken by output. That is, is hysteresis. So the level is not given abstractly, especially in Keynesian economics, because the level is not linked to full employment. So you can't say the level is that one which gives you full employment. If you could, then full employment output would be a, a particular path. If, in, if uh, labor supply is growing at a steady rate, it would be a horizontal line on a log linear scale. And then you could say, that's where it is. But once you're a Keynesian, you say, well, we could be below that. Where below? And the answer is it depends on aggregate demand, or more specifically, on the history. And there's a somewhat of a difference between aggregate demand and ag history. OK? Everybody with me here? Now, if the labor supply was fixed, or growing at an exogenous rate, and technical change was exogenous, then the same thing could be said that the path a full employment output, which is inherent called the natural growth rate, is a straight line. And then you have to be there. But once you introduce the idea of unemployment as a normal phenomena, then you could be below it. But as long as the path of, of uh, full employment output itself is independent of the rest of the path that you've taken, then even if you're below it, if there's like a 7% unemployment or 4% normal rate of unemployment, you're still determined by the full employment path. You're just below it. So you'd still be determined. So what's clear there is that the Keynesian argument that you can move up and down implies something about an indeterminate unemployment rate, it seems. But the other possibility, and that's the one I'm going to show you is in fact the general argument, is that the growth rate itself may depend on I'm, I'm sorry, the population growth rate and, and uh, the, I'm, ugh, let me try that again. We can erase it from the tape later. The labor supply growth rate and the rate of growth of technical change, which defines the path of full employment output, that path itself can change because the labor supply can change when aggregate demand changes. The rate of technical change can change when aggregate demand changes or when the growth rate changes. So. I want to uh, set up already the fact that there's no reason to believe that the growth rate of labor supply is independent of circumstances. Growth rate of population, maybe, but not growth rate of labor supply. What's the difference? Labor participation rate. A given population uh, does not imply a fixed number of workers. because That depends on how many of those are involved in the labor market. Traditionally, for instance, women, children, uh, minorities of various sorts would be brought in and taken out. And that's a flexible labor supply. Secondly, the rate of growth of productivity, which is technical change, 
can obviously respond to profitability and demand and so on. Uh, if there's a shortage of labor in a local area, let's say here, there's a shortage of labor, I can import labor from over there. And em employers do this all the time. That's the whole point, is that if there's a shortage of labor, capitalism sets up um, more porous barriers, because they're usually barriers to prevent labor that's available in large sum to come in. And those barriers become more porous because capitalists themselves go across a barrier and bring them across. I mean, in the United States, that's pretty obvious historically uh, and in the present day that uh, labor can be brought in or expelled as the need arises. In the same sense, technical change has an incentive structure. If there is a tightening of the labor market and there's a shortage of labor, then there's an incentive for uh, firms to figure out how to save on that labor to increase the rate of productivity growth, so to speak, uh, so that they can make use of less labor. And that means that their demand for labor also goes down. And that is something uh, we want to allow for. Now, the point of this is that once you introduce the Keynesian idea that your path depends on your history, and then you introduce the idea that productivity growth and labor supply growth also are flexible, then they also depend on your history. It doesn't mean that it's all indeterminate. All you need to say is that they are responsive to the circumstances, to the incentives. Just like I said before, there is a habit in economics, an algebraic habit, of assuming that the savings rate is fixed. And there's little rationale for that algebraic habit. Kolecki says the savings rate of, of firms depend on the investment of firms. If he'd stuck to that, then the savings rate would be endogenous, and you'd have to figure out some way to determine, some other way to determine what determines the Kolecian level of output, because the s, the small s, would also be a variable. But then when he comes to the formalizing of it, the simplest assumption to make is that it's fixed. And the trouble with simple assumptions is that they simplify your algebra, but they complicate your logic. Because then you get into a whole series of contradictions that are characteristic of Keynesian economics, and that's what I want to talk about today. Keynesian, post-Keynesian, even Goodwin and the, and the Marxian tradition, and the post-Goodwin Marxian tradition, come about from this algebraic convenience. And that's not always bad, but the trouble is that if you're making an, an assumption of fundamental importance about something which is you take to be fixed, which is intrinsically variable and endogenous, then you get a different story. So just as I argued before, that as long as you allow the savings rate of firms to respond to the investment needs of businesses, to the finance gap of businesses, then the overall savings rate becomes endogenous. Because even if workers don't care and don't respond, the part of the savings rate that comes from firms does, and therefore the whole rate moves up and down in, in response to this gap. And I argued last time that that gives you a fundamentally different macro outcome. Now we're going to do the other side of that, which is the uh, uh, productivity and uh, labor supply endogeneity. So we're going to put the two together, and then you get something quite remarkable. You get the idea you get a formalization of the idea that growth is driven by profitability, as in Keynes and Marx. And yet, you can have normal capacity utilization, as in Marx and Harrod. And that solves a puzzle, which is that the two sides are split along those lines, because they each make an unwarranted uh, assumption about the fixity of some variable when it is fundamentally a variable of uh, flexibility. Okay? Now, these are small changes. It doesn't require the variable to do all the work. It just requires it to be somewhat sensitive. And as long as it is, the whole thing gets dragged along. The speed will depend, obviously, on how sensitive. But if you think back in history, uh, when the United States was formed, uh, US capital had a shortage of labor. Of course, they killed off the Native Americans in large degree and isolated them, but they had a shortage of the labor they wanted, the skilled labor of their European connections. And they imported them. A huge numbers of people came here because of the prospect of getting land and work. And so when we say the labor supply is given by a fixed curve, what does that mean? 
there was a large pool of labor supply displaced by capital, impoverished by capital, in fact, in Europe. And it was brought here. And so it moved over here. Now, when has there been a time in the world where there has not been this labor supply? In for available for capital, anyway. So you have to be alert to algebraic uh, distortions of some fundamental variables. I'm not saying that you can't assume sometimes that a variable is constant, but you have to have a good argument for that. Uh, and that argument uh, should be justified in some way empirically and theoretically. OK. So I demonstrated in the previous chapter that injections of purchasing power can affect the level of output, and then they can affect the profit rate. Because if you have a higher level of output, you might have, have a wage share, depending on what's happening to productivity and labor supply. And that's where these other variables come in. But if they do have a negative impact, in the sense that the wage share rises, positive impact for workers, that means the profit share falls and the profit rate falls. And I pointed out then that what would happen is, if the profit rate is driving the rate of growth, here you have the jump in purchasing power. You come up to a new level of output, but now the output is growing more slowly. So as before, you were going along a rate like this. You're now growing at a lower rate. And at some point, you're going to be actually at a lower level than you were before. Because what you've gained in the pumping, you've lost in the rate of growth, if that's what happens. So then you have to ask, under what conditions is it that a pumping of the economy has a negative impact on the profit rate? And that's another way of asking. When does it have a positive impact on the wage share? Because the capital output ratio doesn't respond very much to these things. So that's the duality. And if you look at it that way, that's a perfectly natural way to ask the question in Marx. Now, if anybody's read uh, chapter 25 of volume one of Capital, which is on the reserve army of labor, then you know that the whole story there is about the fact that as the Unemployment rate shrinks for any reason. Well, let's suppose that we take Marx's thing and says, well, some, for some reason, the unemployment rate shrinks. OK, maybe the government does uh, uh, deficit spending, or maybe because gold is discovered and it pours in, and uh, demand rises, and so output rises, and employment rises, and the reserve army shrinks. If that was the only part of the story, then you'd stop there. It is what it is. But Marx's argument is that the reserve army shrinks. This puts pressure on the wages. So wages rise relative to productivity. So now the wage share is rising. That means the profit share is falling, which means the profit rate is falling, which means the demand for labor slows down. And eventually, other things being equal, it fills up the, it fills the reserve army back up. And it brings it. And he says it may not come down, may not come down to the same level, maybe even lower than before or above. It depends more concrete conditions. But there's an intrinsic feedback mechanism that limits the degree to which you can pump up the system. And that's the key point. That's the point, in my opinion, missing from the Keynesian and Koletskian argument, the idea that there is a limit to this pumping process. And I'm going to try to show you that that explains not only the actual path of the US economy, uh, but also the, the great and vexing, apparently vexing problem of when Keynesians were pumping up the economy in the 1950s and 1960s, instead of unemployment coming down to some uh, desirable level and inflation remaining low, they had unemployment rising and inflation rising more. Which tells us, I'm going to argue, comes directly from this profitability limit in a different way. So that's going to be the next discussion, so to speak, after we do this. So now we're focused on this critical issue, which is the relationship between the employment level, the wage share, and uh, then uh, uh, by implication, the growth rate. OK? Now, the first thing is that it, it, in the classical tradition, it was pretty obvious, obvious analytically and empirically, that unemployment exerts downward pressure on wages. As I said, this chapter 25, volume one of Capital Argument in Marx and the Reserve Army Labor is exactly a trade-off between a flexible real wage 
which rises when unemployment shrinks and therefore causes profitability to fall and therefore that makes unemployment rise again and puts reduced pressure, puts pressure, downward pressure on the real wage. But it goes back even further. Ricardo originally thought that displacement of workers by mechanized technology would be temporary. They would lose their jobs or they would pick them up elsewhere. Very new, this is what the neoclassicals always argue. Well, I'll show you, you'll lose your job, but you'll get one somewhere else because we assume there's automatic full employment. And that was Ricardo's original thinking too. But he recognized that uh, mechanization actually reduces the demand for labor at any given growth rate. If productivity is rising, you need fewer workers to sustain the same rate of growth of output. So uh, the demand for labor grows more slowly, and that can lower the real wage. And then he says, on the other hand, the lower real wage could spur accumulation, which means make growth more rapid, and you pick up the demand for labor. So now you see the elements already here of the reserve army of labor story. Right? And it could uh, make products more competitive on the world market so that it could increase exports. So that's a kind of Keynesian part of the story. Export demand will rise because the cost of exports will go down. These are real elements. And we need to put them in their place, so to speak. Obviously here I'm going to focus on the connection between the real wage productivity and the profit rate and growth. And I've always said the connection in Marx, so I won't repeat that. But it's interesting when you look at it in the classical tradition that they do not focus on the nominal wage because they treat the struggle over the nominal wage as a struggle over the real wage. In other words, the distinction between the nominal wage and the real wage becomes relevant only if prices are changing in some rapid way, unpredictable way, actually. Because workers are struggling for real wages, they can have some idea how prices are rising or falling and they fight for that. So the idea of distinguishing between um, uh, nominal and real wage doesn't come up because it's not a relevant issue. And the reason is because in capitalism until recently prices rose and fell. This is 1790. The dark line is the UK uh, price index and the uh, less dark line is the US and from 1790 to 1930 you can see prices go up, down, go up, down, up, down, up, down and by 1940 they are roughly the same place they were in, 1970, in 1790, 1790, 1940. So the idea that you have to take inflation into account and allow for that, that idea had no material basis, so to speak, and therefore was not part of the normal discussion in, as a central factor. Obviously, locally you do have price rises and there's plenty of discussion of what happens when you have a, a jump in prices and then a collapse in prices and so on. But it's not relevant to the central tendency to speak because prices didn't have a central tendency. But notice how different the picture is after 1940. And this is going to be the subject of the next chapter. How do we explain that? This fundamental change in the uh, form of monetary expression of capitalism. Okay? And there are many hypotheses. We, the US goes off gold and the UK goes off gold as a nominal anchor here in the 1930s. And then, uh, then in this period right up here is when there's a big jump uh, um, where is it, 1970, 67, 70 is where the Bretton Woods Agreement falls apart. And, but you notice that this process really does start in some fundamental way long before that. So something is happening and that's the question, what is that thing? Now, if you were a Keynesian, you'd say, oh, workers were causing their wages to rise and therefore prices rise. But workers were fighting all for wage rises throughout the history of capitalism. Why is that not causing inflation? Are markups constant only after 1940, but before that they were all flexible? I mean, what's the story? And I want to show you that there's a simple story that encompasses all of these things, but especially explains this, this part.
So I'm going to focus here on the employment wage, unemployment wage uh, uh, story and the relation of labor supply to labor demand and the effects of inflation will be addressed later in the next chapter. Uh, the effects of inflation will be addressed here, but the causes of inflation, the explanation for this will be addressed uh, in the next chapter. Now let me remind you of, uh, of the structure of the argument in, in the classical tradition of wages and how similar it is to the structure of the argument about prices. Because the point is that these theoretical arguments are really unitary. They are from some fundamental principles. They are not just ad hoc models that you make up to see if you can get uh, uh, a nice uh, uh, cyclical movement in a nonlinear dynamics. Those are fun, by the way. I've spent quite a bit of time doing that, and they are a lot of fun. But the issue here is what are the fundamental arguments that you can come up with? First of all, in the classical theory, firms within any given industry set prices. I made that point throughout the last semester and this, uh, that price setting is the characteristic feature of existence of capital. That competition is then the discipline on the price setting. Firms always set prices. I mean, how are you going to know the price of something if there's not a sticker attached to it? And that sticker doesn't come from the Walrasian auctioneer, by the way. It actually comes from the person working in the store who puts a sticker on there. Then the question is, why that number and why not some other number? And that's where competition is the limiting factor. So from that point of view, um, competition forces the prices of similar products to be roughly equal. So if this is one industry and you are all competing for the same customers in the industry or different sets of customers spread out in the industry, then your prices can't be too far apart because customers can move from one of you to the other, from one seller to the other. Much easier with the internet, but even in the old days, if there was enough, two supermarkets were selling things with different goods and the price was sharp enough, people would move. So I, whenever I bought a computer, I would spend a lot of time in the olden days and King Arthur was still alive, walking around from store to store trying to see what the bet price is on a computer. You'd call them up, you'd talk to them, you go down, take a look. Now you can just do it on the internet. But that's the same thing. It's price equalization. That's the point. It's the pressure on prices. So that doesn't tell you, however, what the price level is. So if I have a price level of roughly 100 here, and I have a price level of roughly uh, 20 here for two different products, that price level is not determined by the equalization process. The equalization just says that all of you will sell at roughly 100. And here it says all of you will sell at roughly 10. But you need another principle to determine what the level is. And that's where competition between industries comes about. Because if that 10 is giving you a profit rate of 30 and that 100 for a different product is giving you a profit rate of 10, then obviously capital will be flowing more rapidly here, expanding the supply, bringing the price down, and here it will be uh, expanding the supply more uh, slowly and possibly below the rate of increase of demand, and the price will go up. So here you'll end up with 110, here you might end up with 7. Okay? And that would be the price that is determined by competition fully, equalized and profit rates equalized in the turbulent manner that we've talked about before. Okay? Now, you understand, therefore, there are two principles. One is the equalization of prices for a given product. So now the parallel will be equalization of wages for a given skill. And the other is the determination of the average, the process by which the, the basic wage, so to speak, is determined, or the wage of any skill level is determined. Now, the difference. That's where the difference comes about between labor capacity or labor power, as Marx calls it, and any other commodity. An ordinary commodity is not only used by capital, but is made by capital, is produced by capital. Its supply is created and can be increased or extinguished. Capital all the time throws mm -hmm. things away that are not necessary. I have mentioned this before, perhaps in the other semester, but I remember reading that uh, there were times in, uh, I think it was, must be about the 1980s, my, my recollection, where there was a huge excess supply 
of hogs in New Jersey. New Jersey bred pigs and hogs, and the excess supply was such that they didn't need them because they couldn't sell them uh, at a profit. On the other hand, if they did sell them, prices would be driven down so low that uh, they would lose even more money. So what they did is they dug up large pit, large pits, and they shot them and dumped them in there to prevent them from entering the market to keep the price up. So capital has a right not only to produce the hog, but right to extinguish the hog if it gets in the way of profitability. The difference with labor power is that labor can shoot back. And that is historically very important because over time, the struggle between the non-produced commodity labor power or labor capacity and the demand and use of it is a struggle between two sets of people. The labor is an active subject in this process. So the particular level of the real wage then, the average level of the real wage, then is a subject of contention between employers and employees. And its purpose is, or the effect is, sorry, effect is to bring about a division of value added. So if you have a particular level of employment and productivity in your industry and you have a value added of 1,000, how much do you keep as a firm? Well, it depends on how much is the equivalent of the wages that you paid. And that depends on the struggle between you and your employees. If you can keep that wage low, then you get to keep most of it. If, on the other hand, that wage is high, you get to keep very little of it. So the rule of the wage becomes central. And of course, workers can move from low wage to high wage. So that's the other part of the story, the mobility of labor. And that brings the wages in line for a particular skill level. And that gives you a general principle of the division of value added in firms. Okay? Now, I'm speaking abstractly, but if you ever pick up any decent textbook in the history of labor struggles, say uh, books by uh, Philip Foner, for instance, a very famous labor historian, you will see that that struggle is a struggle of blood, a bitter struggle involving uh, violence against labor, usually with the state and collaborating with employers to try to keep labor in its place. But over time, labor achieves a, a space and a higher wage uh, coming from the strength of labor relative to capital, the, that division of the value added. Now, when I say division of value added, it's very abstract. But of course, that's exactly the notion of the rate of surplus value in Marx is the division of value added, right? It's a surplus over the value of labor power or variable capital, uh, profit over variable capital. So that idea of the division of value added comes about from the observation that firms everywhere have to fight for how much they get of the value added in their firm, and workers have to fight for how much they get. So capital is always pushing down on the wage, and labor is always pushing back up on the wage. And that's what it means to say there's a balance of power. There are times when these two forces do balance, and other times they move one direction or the other. And we can see this historically by just simply looking at the history of labor struggle. I noticed this morning when I was uh, getting dressed that uh, Governor Cuomo's new bill on a $15 minimum wage, which, by the way, is exactly what we're talking about, a struggle to maintain a certain standard of living, that that wage may take, uh, under the new rules, may take uh, 10 years to arrive at. Because the way they're going to do it, they're going to phase it in a little bit of line. Why is that? Because employers everywhere are trying to oppose it. And politicians respond more to employers than they do to employees. so. But there is pressure from the employees. So the $15 minimum wage is going to be announced with great fanfare, except for the detail that it's actually not going to be there for a long time, uh, if they get away with that, if they can do it. You know, obviously, uh, labor is going to respond to that. But even organized labor doesn't necessarily have a, a lot of uh, interest in this issue. 
So that tells us another thing, which is that the struggles of wage struggles are supported or hampered by institutional and social and political structures. They don't occur in the air, so to speak. They, are, they take place on the ground, and that ground is a concrete ground developed historically over time. Read, for instance, any of the histories of the welfare state to have some understanding of how that pressure to create a, a, a base for existence of, of workers and the existence of most people comes about historically. It doesn't come about through the largesse of a king here or there. It comes about sometimes, it appears that way, as a response to the pressure underneath. But it comes about through that pressure and to its accommodation in a social structure. Any questions on this? Now contrast this story which I told, which is, I believe, fairly easily documented as a historical story. If this was a room of historians, they would go, well, come on, come on, you're saying the obvious and trivial, but this is a room of economists, so I do have to say the obvious and trivial many times, because in neoclassical theory, none of this appears. Neoclassical theory assumes that all agents are price takers, including firms and including labor, labor power, workers. And workers actually in, in the labor market are assumed to passively offer the number of hours they would like to work at any given wage. That's the labor supply schedule. And then firms are supposed to passively offer the amount of labor they would like to employ at different wages. That's a labor demand schedule. And where those two meet, the uh, wage will arrive unless you interfere at a point where the amount of labor supplied that offered by firms and by workers and the amount of, of uh, uh, labor demanded by firms will intersect at some common wage. And that's the story uh, that Walras tried to uh, summarize in the idea that an auctioneer would take these bids. I'm taking bids from workers, give me your bid, give me your bid. I'm taking bids from firms, give me your bid, give me your bid. And I announce, okay, $3.20 clears the bids. That means that everybody who is offered to work at $3.20 would supply a certain number of hours, which happen to be exactly the number of hours that firms will employ at $3.20. And that means that when that bidding closes, there's full employment. And in the Walrasian story, no worker is allowed to actually work until the market is clear, and no employer is allowed to hire until the market is clear. So by definition, any existing wage is a market clearing wage, right? So this is a very, uh, you can see it's a very uh, seductive story because it makes it seem as if markets immediately and automatically balance demand and supply of everything at a market clearing price. And that price implies, therefore, that workers are willing to work for that amount, that price of a certain number of hours. And uh, firms are willing to hire those number of hours of labor at that price. So from this point of view, both in terms of commodity prices and labor uh, commodity, labor power prices, have only one aspect in the neoclassical story, which is that they are market clearing prices. That's the only function they serve. And for that reason, they have to be flexible, which is why neoclassicals emphasize flexibility so much. Now, it's admitted that workers do bargain. Because when you leave the Walrasian world, you need to come to the world of perfect competition. And there, you have to tell the story somewhat differently. And you do it by cheating. You say, well, firms take the prices given. Labor takes the wages given. Firm takes the wages given. And somehow, this wage will come to balance. But as many people pointed out, there is no price setter. If everybody's taking the price as given, who gives the price? And there's been point out many times in neoclassical theory that there is no price giver because once you take the Walrasian auctioneer out of the story, you're left with the hole. You tell the same story, but you leave the hole. So in this perfectly competitive uh, world of neoclassical theory, there is no role for the struggle between capital and labor in the determination of the equilibrium real wage. The real wage is that 
wage which will give you full employment of labor. That's equilibrium wage. There isn't any other. Conversely, if anything interferes, if there is unemployment, then it must be because something has interfered in this market clearing wage. Now notice here, in the neoclassical story, it's very important that the real wage be flexible. So often when people want to talk about Keynes in the neoclassical tradition, they say, oh well, because you see he was talking about inflexible wages. And inflexible wages would create unemployment because here's the demand and supply for labor, here's the wage. Well, if the wage is too high, then you're going to get uh, supply of labor bigger than the demand of labor. And that's a classical, uh, that's a, a typical neoclassical representation of unemployment. But that is not <coughs> the um, story in Keynes, and it's certainly not the story in the classical tradition. So I'm going to come back to that. The main point here, I just want to alert you, is that in the classical tradition, the real wage is in fact flexible. Pick up volume one of Capital, chapter 25, you'll see the whole mechanism of the creation of a persistent rate of unemployment is based on a flexible real wage not on an inflexible real wage, but on the contrary, on a supremely flexible real wage. So how could it be that one school of thought says that a flexible real wage gives you full employment, and the earlier school of thought says that a flexible wage, real wage can give you persistent unemployment, and that's the, what we want to explore here, how to demonstrate how that's possible. So now Keynesian theory. Keynes himself believed in competitive markets. He, he, adamantly rejected the idea that his theory was based on imperfect competition, imperfect this or imperfect that. Uh, and he was aware, obviously, of the key fundamental neoclassical claim that unemployment would drag the real wage down. Alas, what he was not apparently aware, for certainly not as far as I know, was that, that the same argument appears in the classical tradition because Keynes often takes neoclassical theory to be the modern, cleaned up representation of, of classical. So when I say classical, I don't mean what Keynes means when he says classical. Keynes means his teachers, which I consider neoclassical or anti-classical. And so uh, I'm not talking about Marshallian or Pigovian or uh, economics. When I say classical, I'm talking about Smith, Ricardo, and Marx. Now he knew and I think he believed that if there's unemployment, it would reduce the real wage. But his argument in various places is that it would be a slow process with a big social cost. So if you have a crisis, instead of the real wage dropping down to the level that give you full employment, in fact, there would be destruction of people's livelihoods, of their social place, displacement without picking them up again and uh, perhaps even a generation lost. So it would be socially devastating. And so he argues that simply waiting for this to work itself out is uh, socially unacceptable. What you need is to have some mechanism to bring the wage, the uh, in economy up, so to speak, rather than allowing labor to fall down to the necessary level, and that's the state. We know that. But notice that Keynes's vision that it, the adjustment of the real wage in the face of unemployment would be too turbulent and socially destructive does not imply, does not deny the fact that unemployment had a negative impact on the real wage. He says the process is something he's opposed to. And the other thing he emphasizes is it takes a long time. And I want to alert you to that because one of the things we're going to ask is how long does it take? I mean, if you're coming from a classical perspective and the real wage does adjust to unemployment, what is the form of that adjustment process and how long does it take? And we're going to look at the data. We're going to see it actually moving year by year in a particular direction in the face of unemployment. So he doesn't believe at all and would, I'm sure, have something devastating to say. Nobody could be more devastating than Keynes except perhaps Marx about rational expectations and the idea of jumping to the ideal outcome. Um, now, In the Keynesian tradition, the Phillips curve comes later. And it comes about really, might, you one might argue, from 
uh, exploring this implication of Keynes, what is the consequence of unemployment on wages? And Phillips actually studies the, un, the rate of change of money wages. And you can see in his original curve that the rate of change of money wages, and you have the unemployment rate on this axis, it's a kind of curve. Now he adjusts for cyclical things, so it's not a curve you get just from the raw data. He takes out the cycles from the data, but that filtered data, so to speak, has a very nice shape, and that's the Phillips curve. And he shows it holds for a very long period of time. So in some sense, it moves very slowly, uh, that there's a structural pat aspect to it, which reflects a social institutional structure built up over 50, 60, 70 years of the curve. So that answers one question, <coughs> which is the time, the duration. The Phillips curve can be viewed as a statement of how long it takes for the rate of change of money wages to adjust to a particular level. Because it's, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, for the level of money wages to adjust, to adjust to a particular level through a particular rate of change of money wages with any degree of unemployment. To put it another way, the Phillips curve is a functional relationship between the rate of change of money wages and unemployment rate as a function. So what's the elasticity? What's the temporal dimension to that? We're going to look at the data actually on that. <clears throat> I, I would argue that if you think of it from this point of view, Phillips was a Keynesian, then, and you think of what Keynes says about how long and difficult the adjustment process is, then any adjustment that Keynes has in mind is a slow adjustment. Slow in the sense that it takes a long and socially, uh, uh, possibly socially devastating time to get there. Is that point clear? Because it's very easy to draw curves and say you jump from here to there if you're not the person who's having to do the jumping. Now, when you come to Harrod, something surprising happens because the whole relationship between wages and profits disappears. Harrod's famous equation says that the rate of growth necessary to maintain full capacity utilization, it depends only on two variables. So the, what he calls a warranted rate of growth, the growth that maintains normal capacity utilization, is equal to the savings rate divided by the capital to capacity ratio, small s over big C. That big C, which is the capital to capacity ratio, is actually the reciprocal of Srafa's profit, maximum profit rate, because it's the capacity to capital is the normal net output over capital, and that in Srafa has a maximum rate of profit. So you can write Harrod's equation in a different way. You can say the rate of growth, of warranted rate of growth of capital, the rate of growth that will give you normal capacity utilization, maintain it, is equal to the savings rate, uh, I have to write right, savings rate, times R, which is the maximum profit rate in the sense of Srafa. R sub N, the normal maximum profit rate. Now notice, R sub N, or Harrod C, which is the reciprocal of it, is given by technology, conditions of labor, and uh, productivity, and so on. And the S, Harrod takes to be given exogenously. So now you have a problem. The rate of growth of capital doesn't depend in any way on profitability. It depends only on technology and the savings rate. So coming from Keynes, who says that investment depends on profitability, and therefore the rate of growth of capital depends on profitability, you get an inversion in which in Harrod, the rate of growth of capital does not depend in any way on profitability. Is that point clear? Because it's, a, it's, the, it's the fork, so to speak, between the Keynesian and classical side and the Herodian uh, side and in between will the post-Keynesian theory trying to get one and not the other in a, in a way I'm going to show right now. Any questions here? <coughs>
So at this level, Harrod has another problem. If the rate of accumulation, the rate of growth of capital, is dependent on the savings rate and the technology, and they're both given, then there's no reason why the actual rate of growth of capital, which determines the employment rate, would be equal to the full employment rate of growth of capital. So let's suppose the actual rate of growth of capital is some number, 5%. Uh, 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 and the rate of growth, a full employment rate of growth, capital needs to be 7%. Well, if it's growing at 5% and the labor supply is growing at 7%, then unemployment must be rising without limit. Conversely, if the growth rate is 7% and the natural growth rate, the one that gives you the full employment output, is 5, then the demand for labor is rising faster than the supply of labor. And that means that you're going to end up with uh, uh, hitting the full employment constraint. And after that, you'd have inflation. So Harrod's problem is that this fixity, which is so simple and so sensible, leads him into the difficulty that he can't make the two sides reconcile. Because he, profitability plays no role in any of this. There's nothing left to fix, nothing left to flexible. Solo takes that story and he says, OK, but the capital output ratio is flexible. That's an aggregate production function. So it'll make the adjustment and it'll give you the full employment story. So that's Solo's answer. It's a brilliant answer. Uh, but Caldor and Passanetti go the other way and say, ah, no, the point is, that the savings rate adjusts. Well, how can the savings rate adjust if the savings rate is fixed? They say, ah, but the savings rate is fixed for each income class. Following Kolecki, workers' wages, workers save out of wages at a certain rate, and capitalists save out of profits at a different rate, and those two rates are not equal. The capitalist rate is higher. Therefore, the average rate can adjust if the ratio of wages to profits changes. And in fact, to make the growth rate of capital equal to the growth rate of productivity and uh, labor supply, which is the full employment growth rate. So the full employment growth rate is some number. The growth rate of capital is above or below that number. But the S can now change by changing the profit wage ratio. So now profits come back into the story, but not as the causal mechanism of growth, but as the mechanism that changes the savings rate. And in fact, if you think about it, if the average savings rate is a mixture of two fixed rates, one high and one low, and that average rate is in between, depending on what's happening with the wage share or the profit share, then the average rate will only come out to the right number if the wage and profit share does the adjusting, which means that equilibrium determines the share of profits to wages. To put it differently, Equilibrium determines the share of wages to productivity, which means that workers have no say in their own real wage, determined by the conditions of full employment. So paradoxically, you go back to the neoclassical story, where the real wage is determined to give you full employment. In Harrod, the real wage is determined by the condition of making the warranted rate of growth equal to the full employment rate. And so it's not that different at that level. Uh, the distribution, class distribution of income is internal and endogenous net changes to bring about productivity. Now, that means that accumulation does not depend on profitability, so Keynes is thrown away. And uh, workers have no influence on their real wage, so Marx is thrown away. But this is a coherent and consistent system that says that what workers get is what the system needs them to get. Okay? And that's the secret of the Herodian Caldor Passanetti uh, story. It's really a story of the endogeneity of the profit rate. Because if the wage share is adjusting, the profit share is adjusting, if the capital output ratio is constant, then the rate, profit rate is doing the adjusting. So another way to think of it is the profit rate is determined by the conditions of equilibrium has nothing to do with class struggle, nothing to do with the uh, organic composition of capital. Well, it has something to do with the organic composition, but nothing to do with class struggle because the wage share is dependent, is determined solely by the requirements of equilibrium, by full employment, actually. So it's very similar to the neoclassical story in that sense. Is that point clear? Because people reading Harrod often don't get that point, but it's an important point because it tells us now
that we have a kind of uh, series of characteristic answers. In neoclassical theory, the wage share is determined by full employment uh, because the wage rate is determined by full employment. In Harrod, Kaldorf, Hassanetti, the wage is determined by full employment because it moves up and down relative to productivity to make full employment possible, to make the savings rate adjust. That's the only function of the movement of the wage, is to make the savings rate adjust to bring the two sides, the warranted rate and the uh, um, uh, natural rate, back into relation with each other. And again, in both sides, there is no room whatsoever for any effect of labor struggles or any effect of workers on their own standard living. They get what the system gives them, what the system needs to give them. Okay. Now you can see why Joan Robinson didn't like this. She said, wait a minute, wait a minute, Maynard, I mean, not many of us could call him Maynard, but anyway, Maynard always believed that uh, investment was driven by profitability, and therefore growth was driven by profitability. But in Harrod, growth is not driven by profitability. Profitability is driven by full employment. So there's something wrong with this story. And she tried, and I discussed in the book different ways, to get around that by saying, look, growth is driven by profitability. But then she runs into this difficulty that she takes the savings rate as given. And remember how much time I spent last time pointing out the savings rate cannot logically be argued as given because savings of firms cannot be independent of the investment of firms. It's the same people sitting at the same table making the decision, you want to invest, how do we want to finance it? And both decisions are simultaneous, so to speak. In fact, as Kaletsky points out, you have to make the finance decision first in order to make the investment purchase. So we're coming little by little to the crux of the problem, which is that if you're going to approach from a classical point of view, you want to have accumulation driven by profitability, as in Keynes. But you also want to have uh, the wage rate determined by historical and social forces, as in reality. So how do we bring those two together? In Kaletskyan theory, you get an even, uh, you get a different and uh, strange story, but very similar in conclusion. Now notice what I said. Neoclassical theory says workers have no say on their wage. Herodian, Kaldor, Passanetti, no say on their real wage. Kaletskyan theory says the same thing. Workers have no say on their real wage. It comes to the, the conclusion a different way, but it's the same. You know, in Kaletskyan theory, in post-Keynesian theory, it's assumed that, that uh, firms uh, add a markup to their costs, to their prime costs, and that markup is given by monopoly and can be provisionally taken as given in, in models. I mean, we seldom can handle more than one variable, uh, one or two variables of note in, in these models. So you take that as given. So that implies that the wage share is given by the markup. Why? Costs are wage costs and materials costs. But if following Adam Smith's decomposition, if you remember, the materials costs are themselves wage costs plus the materials costs are the materials costs. So you can see that that cost structure is essentially the wage structure, as post Keynesians immediately point out. It depends essentially on wages at any given level of productivity. Well, if I have direct and indirect wages as my cost and I add a markup to it, then the ratio of the wages to the price, because the price is the cost plus the markup. Here's the cost, here's the markup. That's the price. I take the price and put it under the wage, I have the real wage. What do I have on the other side? The markup. So what determines the real wage? The markup. That means that capitalists decide the wage of workers according to the capitalist decision to the profit that they would like, the markup. And Kolesky was very aware that in his own argument, therefore, workers were powerless to determine their real wage, not to mention the wage share. Capitalists decide the productivity of labor. They decide the markup, 
and therefore they decide the wage share, but the wage share is a wage rate divided by the productivity of labor. So capital decides the productivity, it decides the wage share, it decides the real wage. How does it do it? If workers fight for more money wages, the price rises, and it brings the real wage back down to the level de determined by the markup. So at the most abstract level, the, the post-Keynesian uh, story has this difficulty that uh, workers have no say also. So that's quite striking, isn't it? Neoclassical theory, workers have no say. Caldor, Passanetti, workers have no say. Post-Keynesian theory, workers have no say in the, in the real wage. And yet the history of labor struggles, it makes it, in my opinion, extremely clear that that's simply false. So how does one accommodate that history? Clearly, you cannot do it within the essential structure of these. You can, you can uh, uh, waterboard them until they bend a little bit and crack here and bring that thing. And that's what Kaletsky does, for instance. He says, well, OK, I, I realize this is a problem. I don't even like it in my own theory. So the, near the end of his life, he's saying, well, but if workers raise their wages, maybe capitalists will get frightened that they'll, if workers will not respond well if they have a markup. So maybe capitalists will have a lower markup. But as he admits, and Keynes admit, this is a very weak way for workers to have any influence. They have to have an influence on their real wage, not through their own struggles, but through the intimidation of capitalists sometimes. But notice that if you admit this later emendation of Kaleski's theory, then a rise in real wages um, um, so Kaletsky says, well, if you have a drop in unemployment and workers are in a stronger position and they raise their real wages, capitalists may be afraid by the strength of this labor. They may not have the same markup. They may reduce their markup. So the workers may get some increase in their wage share and real wage. That implies something like a Phillips curve in which the variable is the wage share, rate of change of the wage share, and the unemployment rate. So it's the Phillips curve, original Phillips curve was the rate of change of money wages. Then Friedman and Phelps moved to the rate of change of real wages. And then now you have in Kaletsky a glimmering of a rate of change of the money wa real wages relative to productivity, which is the rate share, rate of change of the wage share. Now, post-Keynesian theory pretty much arose on Kaletsky in a variety of ways. As Lavoie points out, post-Keynesian theory is notably eclectic. Uh, some post-Keynesians say that's great because it means everybody has a different point of view. And others say it doesn't make any sense because everybody has a different point of view. So it depends on how you feel about inconsistent and um, 100 flowers blooming. Uh, but they almost all rely on one thing, which is some form of a monopoly markup pricing. That's a kind of characteristic feature of a post-Keynesian argument. That's one feature. The other feature, of course, is which I'm going to come to, is the idea that the capacity utilization rate is generally different from some desired level. It's usually low. It's below that, because that's associated with the idea of flexibility to uh, pump up the economy. Godley, for instance, um, is an example of the pure post-Keynesian position in which the wage share is determined by the average monopoly markup. He explicitly rejects the notion that inflation depends on the level of employment. So he rejects any kind of Phillips curve. Uh, in his case, prices are determined by markups on money wages. And given that they had determined a markup on money wages, the best you can have is a kind of Kaletskian con uh, competing markup story, competing, con uh, conflicting, uh, conflicting claim story. That is to say, workers want a wage of $10 in real terms, and firms want a markup. But if the workers raise their wage, then the firms will raise their markup, and the markup is a fixed markup on the wages, then the real wage will go back to what it was before. right? Because if uh, the price is proportional to the wage through a fixed markup, then the rate of change of price is equal to the rate of change of wages. But the real wage is the rate of change of money wages minus the rate of change of price. And since the markup is fixed, that's 0. So therefore, 
the real weights can't change. That's a fundamental implication of a fixed markup in Kolatsky. Uh, Godley at some point says, well, okay, this can lead to a kind of uh, uh, inflation spiral. Uh, workers raise their wages, capitalists raise their prices, then workers know their real wage has gone down, so they raise their price wage some more, capitalists, and so inflation spiral. What's interesting is if that were the story, then why, historically, did this not happen from the beginning? Because workers were always fighting for raising wages in the beginning. And so one answer, which is, in my opinion, a completely fictitious answer, is, well, there's only monopoly in the later period. That's not even in the post-Keynesian theory. Even their own argument says that's not true. They argue, typically, monopoly comes about here, in the 1890s. If you look at the history of the argument of monopoly in Peron and Sweezy and Kaletsky and others, monopolization of capital comes before. But, and so, yes, you could read this as a price rise, but on the other hand, if you look at it in terms of the long waves, you see it comes back down. The real secular rise only takes place later. And nobody tries to show that the secular rise is associated with a hugely steeply rising degree of concentration or monopoly power or anything like that. So it comes back to the fact that workers are the cause of this price rise in the post-war period. And that brings me to uh, Goodwin. I want to try to get through. Oh, God, I'm going so slow. OK. What's important about Goodwin is that his model, his uh, formulation of Marx's reserve army of labor story is path-breaking in a variety of ways. Not so much because of the translation of it into algebra, because of the very beautiful formalization which he comes about, uh, Goodwin, which he brings about. Goodwin takes the argument in Marx and he maps it, so to speak, into a famous set of uh, equations known as the Lotka-Volterra equations, the predator-prey model. Though, as Solo points out in Goodwin's actual mapping, the predator is the worker and the prey is the capitalist because in the strict equations, that's the, the U and V rep represent the predator and prey. So in Goodwin's mapping. Uh, but it becomes a f the fount of modern classical and post-Keynesian approaches uh, in many ways, generated a huge literature. And I want to just uh, talk a little bit about the elements of the story because they relate to what I've been talking about in terms of savings rate, capacity utilization, and profit-driven accumulation, and so on. Uh, Goodwin assumes that Savings, the rate of savings is fixed. And that all savings comes out of profit. Now, if you say that all savings comes out of profit, then savings is proportion and the savings rate is fixed and the total savings depends on the profit. Which means the savings rate depends on the profit share. Because if total savings is equal to profit, then divide savings by output, that's a savings rate. Divide profit by output, that's a profit share. So this is an example, a simple version of the caldor passanetti idea that the savings rate is flexible only through a changing balance between profits and wages. Okay? So the flexible savings rate is here, but it's precisely because the profit rate does the adjustment and the savings rate reflects that adjustment. Now, in this simple model, and it's uh, very elegant because it, it abstracts from details like that, it, it also implies that the rate of accumulation is equal to the rate of profit. Because if savings is equal to profit, then investment equals to savings implies that investment is equal to profit. Investment divided by the capital stock is the rate of accumulation. Profit divided by the capital stock is a profit rate. So the rate of growth of capital is equal to the profit rate. You can think of that as a limiting case of the idea that the rate of growth of capital depends on the profit rate. In this case, he makes it equal. And you can see other people come along and made it dependent on an interest rate and all that, but the basic connection is there. So on one hand, he has the caldor passanetti connection, that the savings rate is flexible only if the profit share changes, 
Now he has the growth rate equal to the profit rate, which means the savings rate is only flexible if the profit rate changes. The flexibility of the savings rate is equivalent to the flexibility of the profit rate. Goodwin assumes that capacity utilization is at the normal level. Implicitly assumes that. So that makes his story a special case of the Caldor Pasinetti story. Special case in the sense that uh, the savings rate reflects the profit share, the distribution between wages and profits, and uh, that um, capacity utilization is normal as in Herod. Those are the two elements of the Caldor Pasinetti extension of Herod. But where he adds on a third element is the idea that the savings rate, uh, the profit rate, is linked to uh, the real wage, and the real wage is linked to the degree of unemployment. That's the key departure, really, in uh, Goodwin. The idea that the uh, profit rate reflects the wage rate and the wage rate reflects the degree of unemployment. So it's a kind of real wage Phillips curve. In fact, he assumes you have a rate of change of real wages on the vertical axis and unemployment on the horizontal axis, you have a real wage Phillips curve, which he approximates by a straight line, even though it's a curve. For first approximation, it's a straight line in the vicinity of the equilibrium. Um, And then, typically, as in Caldor and Passanetti, he assumes the rate of growth of the labor force is constant, and the rate of growth of productivity is constant. So that the full employment rate of output is constant. The full employment rate of output is determined by the rate of growth of productivity, which is the displacement of labor, and the rate of growth of labor supply. So two kinds of creation of the labor supply. Displacement of labor, as productivity goes up, you need fewer workers for any given growth rate. And uh, uh, the growth rate of the population gives you the labor supply at this. So the, the natural rate of growth in Goodwin is the same as in Caldor and Passanetti and all that. It's fixed. So the key loop in Goodwin is really the link between profitability, wages, and unemployment which is the reserve army of labor loop. That's exactly what Goodwin is trying to bring out. Now, I'm going to mention uh, one point which is obscure yet, but I'm going to come back to it. Goodwin assumes that the rate of change of real wages is a function of the unemployment rate, so that the higher the unemployment rate, the lower the rate of growth of real wages. It drags down real wage growth. And at a certain point, real wage growth will be negative. So if I have, I'm going to come back to those curves. I have a horizontal here, and I have uh, a rate of growth of real wages here. It, this part is positive, and it's going down as the unemployment rate is rising. At some point, it crosses that axis, and that's the point at which the rate of growth of real wages is zero, and that's a particular critical unemployment rate, because that's where the system is neither growing real wages nor shrinking them, but stable. Now, that doesn't mean it's an equilibrium of the system, because he, but you can translate that. His curve can be translated into the rate of growth of the wage share, because the wage share is a real wage over productivity. The rate of growth of the wage share is the rate of growth of real wages minus the rate of growth of productivity. But Goodwin assumes the rate of growth of productivity is a fixed number. So whatever that Phillips curve is in, in real wages for Goodwin, that same one shifted back by a constant, which is the rate of growth of productivity, is the real wage curve. So Goodwin has a curve that I mentioned was also similar to Kolesky's last kind of argument, which is that the rate of growth of the wage share is a negative function of unemployment. And that's pretty much the argument you get in Marx. So that's kind of interesting to keep track of. Now the key thing is that he puts all these together, and we're going to come back to this uh, in a formulation in which the which his argument represents the argument in Marx, which is that 
if you have an unemployment rate, uh, let's say you have a, a, a growth rate of output, which represents a constant unemployment rate, the normal rate of unemployment, the system goes above that, it then comes back down, and it goes below it, and then goes back up. So the system cycles around a normal rate of unemployment, and these cycles are self-repeating uh, cycles. They're centers, so they're actually unstable if you add noise to them, but leaving that aside, it's a beautiful thing to see and simulate that spiral, uh, that cycle. It just continues back and forth. So that his point is twofold. First is that this system set, settles at a persistent unemployment rate. That's Marx's argument. And secondly, you have a persistent cycle in the process because it overshoots and undershoots perpetually. Okay? It's not a limit cycle. A limit cycle can be stable with noise. This is a center. So if you add noise to it, it gets uh, out of control. But that's not hard to then adapt it, and so many people have done that. So the beauty of the argument is that you can derive both persistent fluctuations and an equilibrium unemployment rate within this simple framework. But again, it's important to understand that in Goodwin's formulation, um, and it can be shown more formally, the real wage that comes out of this story is the wage that you need to make the growth rate equal to the uh, normal growth rate. And you cannot have an additional determination for labor. In fact, increasing the strength of labor, which in Goodwin's case, he has a curve of the real wage versus unemployment. The strength of labor increasing would move that curve up. But that means the curve is coming down here. Uh, and the, un, and the, rate where it crosses the, the point where it crosses the axis is the normal rate of unemployment. That's where the rate of change of the wage share is zero, if you think of this as a wage share curve. If you shift the curve up due to stronger labor, then it's going to hit the axis further down, which means that the unemployment rate is going to rise. So the paradoxical consequence of Goodwin's uh, treatment, which is again very similar to all the other treatments, is that not only workers have no say in their unemployment rate, which is determined by, uh, in, in their wage share, which is determined by uh, the forces of bringing you to equilibrium. But if they get stronger, they will just have more unemployment. Now, just on the surface of it, that seems quite contrary to the historical evidence. Um, and it also seems pretty much contrary to the argument in, uh, at least in Marx, that increasing strength of labor will just be showing up as more unemployment. But it's very consistent with neoclassical story, the neoclassical theory. Now, I'm going to be doing this more formally, but I want to lay out the elements here. I'm skipping over lots of stuff I do there, so I'm not going to be able to talk about the post-Goodwin, post-Keynesian models, uh, Ulfstetter, Velopoli, uh, Glomgowski and Kruger, uh, even Taylor, I'm going to run out of time, so I'm going to just skip that. Uh, Shaw and Desai, Van de Ploeg, Sportelli. Well, let me say a little bit about Taylor, actually, because I'm out of respect for an esteemed colleague, but also because of respect for his great place in the post-Keynesian structuralist uh, framework. Taylor typically has prices determined by markups on costs. That's a Koletskian, post-Keynesian um, starting point. That implies, at that abstract level, the wage share is determined by the monopoly power firms. So workers have no say in their own real wage, because firms determine their productivity and the firms determine their uh, wage share, and therefore their real wage. But then he says in the short run, it can be more complicated, and he pro proposes a model uh, in which the process of adjustment creates certain cyclical movements. The long run has to be the same as this one, but the short run. Workers have a target real wage in mind when they bargain for a money wage. 
um, firms have a target profit share in mind when they set their prices. This is very similar to the argument in Godley and similar to the argument in Rothorn in an earlier period where they, two sets of targets conflict and something happens. Each side adjusts their targets in light of what actually happens. And then the adjustment process yields paths for money wages, real wages, and the wage share. And here he adapts the Goodwin model into, which is a long run model, into a short run model. Uh, Post Keynesians typically argue that everything happens in the short run and that there is no long run, really, because they deny normal capacity utilization and workers have no say on wages, uh, no fundamental say. So everything is viewed in terms of effective demand, capacity utilization, movements in the short run, markups. Um, and so this is different from Goodwin because Goodwin is specifically talking about normal capacity utilization in the long run, not the short run. But he modifies those equations, so to speak, to, to explicitly uh, model the short run. He assumes profit-led growth, a dynamic Keynesian multiplier. This is uh, Taylor 2004. Uh, the citation is in my book. Um, and he ends up with a relationship in which the rate of growth of the wage share in the short run can respond either positively or negatively to the level of capacity utilization. Now, what does that mean? Imagine that you pump up the economy. If you pump up the economy, then one possibility is that you'll create more employment, certainly, if you pump up the economy. And if productivity growth doesn't keep up with the higher, uh, uh, the, 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 the pressure, I'm sorry, pump up the economy, more employment, more output, more employment, therefore pressure on the wage. If that pressure on the wage translates into a rising wage share, then capacity utilization and the wage share will be positively correlated. Is that point clear? If I pump up the economy, I pump up capacity utilization, because in the short run, capital stock is given. I'll pump up employment. If that pumps up the wage share, then the wage share is positively correlated with capacity utilization. But the other outcome in, in Taylor's model is that uh, the wage share can be, can go down. And if the wage share goes down, then you have a negative uh, uh, correlation between capacity utilization and the wage share. The trouble is that it's, though it applies Goodwin's equations in a certain way, it translates them into the short run story, it still holds the two central points of the post keynesian tradition. One is the markup, given markup, and the other is the idea that capacity utilization is a free variable. There's nothing there to make the capacity utilization go towards the normal. In fact, Keynesians, the, the one who's most clear about it, the two who are most clear about this, Amitabha Dutt and Marc Lavoie, point out or argue that this is a fundamental feature of Keynesian economics, post-Keynesian economics. If you say that there's normal capacity utilization, you can't have all the typical things like the paradox of thrift. Because the paradox of thrift says, given any investment and divided by the savings rate, I get equilibrium output, short run equilibrium output, investment over the savings rate. That's a multiplier story. If I then save more, I'm increasing the denominator at any given level of investment, then the output must go down. That's a paradox of thrift. Saving more will make output go down. <clears throat> well, that paradox of thrift only obtains if the investment is independent of that. But what's happening? If I save more and output goes down, then capacity utilization will go down. Capacity utilization goes down, it's going to impact on investment. And if that makes investment go down, then you can't say which way the outcome's going to come. And the story is fundamentally changed. And so Keynesians, post-Keynesians typically hold at bay the idea that the capacity utilization rate will move towards a normal level. Because when you do that, you start to enter, 
Herod's territory, and if you enter Herod's territory and you retain the idea that savings rate is constant, then you're back to Caldor, Passanetti, and the whole idea that the distribution of income must do the adjusting and so on. Okay, so you can see that a certain theme has come, come about here, which is that if you look in, in standard theory, you see certain common assumptions, uh, the most striking of which to me is the idea that workers essentially have no say on their standard of living. That it's a systemic outcome based on the requirement of making growth equal to the full employment growth rate, or at least to the normal rate of unemployment growth rate. And secondly is the idea that savings rates are fixed out of different types of income, including the savings rate of businesses. And I spent some time in the last few lectures talking about why I think that's wrong. So that's a clue already. And the third, of course, is that capacity utilization can be anything. That there's no mechanism to bring it back to normal. Now these are three characteristic features of the post-Keynesian tradition, not neoclassical. Neoclassical says savings rates are fixed, but the wage brings you to full employment, and the capital capacity ratio is full, employment, is full capacity, so it doesn't have that problem. Um, it does have a fixed savings rate. Post-Keynesian theory says savings rates are fixed for individual levels of income, capacity utilization is a free variable, and nothing will bring you back to that normal, and workers have really essentially no say on their wage. Caldor, Passanetti, the same thing. Uh, and Goodwin, surprisingly, uh, the same thing in the end. In fact, in Goodwin, even stronger argument that increasing the strength of labor will actually make unemployment rates higher. Now, it should be said that this might all entirely be true. It might be absolutely correct, or it might be an artifact of an assumption which was unjustified along the way. I've already picked out one that I'm going to make use of now, which is the idea that savings rate cannot be fixed, uh, cannot be independent of the investment rate, to put it more specifically, uh, because business savings cannot be in independent of business investment. Um, but then we come, therefore, to a kind of branch if you take capacity utilization as a free variable, which post-Keynesians believe you have to do in order to have room for demand determination, if demand is going to have the ultimate effect, then the capacity utilization must be free to move up and down with demand, and rather than readjust itself, so to speak. So they insist on that as a kind of characteristic feature. On the other hand, Harrod and Goodwin assume that capacity utilization goes to normal, but if end up with the idea that accumulation is driven by the savings propensity. So you can have a Keynesian story that accumulation is driven by demand, uh, you, and a uh, post-Keynesian story, and you have capacity utilization as a free variable. You can have a Herodian story that accumulation is driven by the savings propensity and capacity utilization is normal. And then you have Keynes's story, which is that investment is determined by profitability. And Keynes never talks about the long run part of the story. Uh, from what I gather, and this is an interesting paper topic for this course, the, the um, uh, correspondence between Keynes and Harrod uh, about the long run. Because Harrod is obviously talking about normal capacity utilization, and he's writing to Keynes, and he's saying, I don't know what he calls Keynes, dear Maynard, or dear Lord Keynes, or whatever, but anyway, you're. Um, uh, we, your story is a static story, and mine is dynamic. It's a growth rate, and Keynes doesn't seem to get it. And there's an interesting paper, which I cite in my book, by uh, Jan Kregel, based on uh, archives in Cambridge about the correspondence between the two. There may be a lot more literature on that that I didn't see, but that's very interesting literature to see how, what was Keynes thinking about, and how is he confronting Harrod's argument that the growth rate 
of capital is independent of profitability, given that Keynes was absolutely clear that investment and hence the growth rate of capital must depend on profitability. The one who mediates that gap is Joe Robinson. So that's another part of the topic that could be explored. So we've already talked about the real wage story. Um, and I'm not going to pursue that anymore here. So my aim in the next lecture is to show that all these elements can be put together in a coherent way. Coherent in the sense that they make sense from the point of view of the uh, theoretical story. It's consistent all the way through. And from the empirical story that uh, we know at the micro level that what firms care about when they make investment is the profitability of their investment. Keynes actually says the, the, the thing that drives enterprise is profit. And I think that's such an obvious point, uh, but that has to be incorporated into a macro framework, obviously, and micro framework, too, for that matter. The whole idea of competition of capital, mobility from one sector to another, what is that? That says that investment is driven by profitability. So if you have the idea of mobility of capital, you already have built in at the micro level the idea that investment is motivated by profitability. In this case, differentials and profitability. So you can't escape it. It has to show up at the macro level also. But then if you show it up at the macro level, you apparently run into this intractable difficulty. If in accumulation is driven by profitability and the savings rate is fixed, then the capacity utilization must be endogenous. Contrary, if the investment uh, and accumulation driven by profitability, and capacity utilization is normal, then the savings rate must be endogenous. Because those three are linked together in a simple relationship, which is the rate of growth is equal to the savings rate times the capacity to capital to capacity ratio, or capacity to capital ratio. Okay, so given leaving that aside, that, that other ratio, R, big R, Sarafa's maximum rate of profit, you have a relationship with two variables. And if one is determined, then the other is determined. So if you take savings rate, you determine the growth rate. If you take the growth rate determined by profitability, then you have to have a story of how the savings rate adjusts to that. And that's why I spent so much time on the idea of the endogenous savings rate. But now we see that putting that into its place as an adjustment to uh, the finance gap to make savings and investment equal uh, uh, over some process, you have the tools for telling the classical story. But in order to tell the classical story, you have to say how the growth rate of capital affects employment, and employment affects wages, and wages affects profitability, and profitability affects the growth rate. So that the loop we've been closing now is we're going to close the next lecture is the relationship between the growth rate of capital, wage rate, unemployment rate, profitability. That loop will give a different dynamic, but I'm going to show you that the dynamic is exactly what you find empirically. You're going to see what looks like a Goodwin dynamic, but the difference is the wage share and the employment rate depends on concrete factors. And one of the striking things is it gives much more room, therefore, for Keynesian arguments. Not post-Keynesian, not Herodian, a little bit Harrod because of normal capacity utilization, but for Keynes's own argument that aggregate demand can have a major impact on the path of output, on the level of output, on the level of employment, and even on the wage share, but within limits. If you don't have those limits, then um, you fall into, in my opinion, the fallacy that capitalism is this malleable system that you can just pump up whenever there's unemployment and you won't have any consequences. And that's exactly what the Keynesians found out was not true in the 70s. So we're going to try to see why, why that's necessarily not true. OK. Um, a few minutes, so maybe I can get to this or not. Well, let me try. So now we want to start with the theory of the real wage. 
And I want to do it in the same way as I've done always, which is start with the micro level. What is it that happens with the real wage at the micro level? We know that labor struggles around work and working conditions and wages are very old. And we know that that struggle ends up determining a wage in the context of production, determining, therefore, the division of value added. Given productivity and a wage, you have a wage share, and that gives you the profit share. Labor pushes up on that division, and capital pushes down on that division. And where you end up is between a minimum social wage, a minimum wage, which is the bottom end of that division, and a maximum wage, which is the wage at which capital quits, so to speak, that particular location. That's why it's micro. Everybody understands if you've ever uh, observed or been involved in a wage struggle that if you demand wages high enough, they can shut the plant. They can say, well, sorry, but uh, no. But in a certain range, you have room to fight. And so the upper limit is when capital quits, and the lower limit is when worker cannot function socially. It might be because they go on strike, or they move to another job, or move to another country, but that's socially determined. So with this, uh, I want to set up a simple almost uh, obvious relation between these variables. We start with value added, which is y sub r. Uh, it's really productivity, which is equal to the real wage and the real profit per worker. That's just an identity. Value added is wages plus profits. If I divide by worker, I get real wage and profits per worker and productivity on this side. So the upper limit to the real wage is productivity because then the profit per worker is zero. That's the abstract upper limit. Actually, concretely, there'll be a, a different, more concrete upper limit to the wage. And the lower limit to the wage is some minimum wage, socially determined and variable over time. So the first point I want to make is that minimum wages are typically related to the wealth of a country. That's startling, perhaps, but pretty obvious that uh, what people consider to be the minimum depends on the wealth of the country. And the wealth here is summarized by productivity. So we can therefore express the relationships up there as uh, a <coughs> relationship between real profits per worker and the real wage. And that line is just the value added line. So I can plot here the real wage uh, at the maximum. It's the output per worker. And uh, at the minimum, it's 0 here. But the real minimum is here. Uh, and the average wage, or the achieved wage, is somewhere in between. So this is just like a budget line. It's exactly the same form, if you remember, in chapter 3, where I did this for the consumer. Now. That means that this point A, any point that all the collectivity of individual labor struggles going on at any moment of time produces a certain real wage and a real profit per worker, then we can characterize that point A as the ratio, uh, or the point A it, uh, determines a ratio of the maximum disposable, a maximum, uh, what do I call it? Uh, not disposable, uh, some discretionary, the maximum discretionary real wage, which is the output over the minimum wage. That's the, the, the wage, the maximum wage that can be achieved is somewhere in between. So that's the maximum discretionary wage. And this. Uh, the height between the maximum wage and the actual wage is the actual discretionary wage. So the ratio of those two defines, is defined by the point A. And so we can call that uh, ratio sigma, 
which is the real wage minus the minimum uh, productivity, which is the maximum real wage minus the minimum. You notice how exactly this is parallel to the other argument in chapter 3. And the ratio of the two is defined by some collective outcome, uh, um, aggregated outcome of individual struggles. So we can rewrite this for the real wage as by just solving this relationship, taking out the real wage. And we can get the real wage is equal to some variable beta times the productivity, where beta depends on alpha, which is the parameter that defines the minimum wage relative to productivity, and sigma, which is this discretionary ratio of uh, actual discretionary wage or the maximum discretionary wage. Now I have, and this ratio is just uh, identity. We've just defined it. And the only uh, substantive relation is the idea that the minimum wage depends on productivity. So that is to say, the Indian minimum wage depends on conditions in India. It is different from the United States minimum wage depends on conditions in the United States, or the Chinese, and so on. It doesn't mean they are the, the parameter linking them is the same in every country. But there is a relationship between what's possible and what's acceptable at the minimum level. Now, if you do that, uh, and again, this little dot here, the, this G is supposed to be a dot. Uh, um, Apple translates this, and I, I'm sorry about that, but I have this problem even with PDF. So this is the rate of change of real wages. Can therefore be written as a rate of change of the uh, labor strength parameter beta and the rate of change of productivity. And what remains then is to talk about how the labor strength parameter, beta, reacts to um, unemployment. Now notice the argument here is that at any particular historical level, uh, social historical level of labor strength in defining a beta here, will also depend on the level of unemployment. And that's really the point of the Reserve Army of Labor and all of the arguments in Goodwin and all that, is that the degree to which the uh, real wage is linked to productivity depends on the degree of unemployment. If there's higher unemployment, the linkage is weaker. If it's low unemployment, linkage, uh, the linkage, uh, the linkage is stronger. So we put this, this is a very general proposition, it's just a function of some unemployment rate. And if the unemployment rate, uh, some uh, benchmark unemployment rate, if the actual unemployment rate is below that, then the beta will rise, which means that workers, because the, the reserve army of labor is below the normal level, then real wages will start to rise. The wage share will start to rise. On the other hand, if the unemployment rate is above the benchmark rate, then it'll start, the real wages and wage share will start to fall. So if you put all this in, you get a very simple relationship, which is that the rate of change of the wage share, defined here as wages over productivity, is a function of the actual unemployment rate and some normal unemployment rate, which we haven't specialized yet, uh, specified yet, except to say that we can allow it to be something other than 0. It could be 0. So this implies something quite interesting, because this is a kind of Phillips curve. But it's a curve in which the variable on the vertical axis is the rate of change of the wage share, not simply the rate of change of real wages. And in fact, as I said, in Goodwin's model, you get just this, because he has a real wage Phillips curve, but he has constant productivity. So if you subtract it from the real wage, you get the rate of change of the wage share. And that's just the same curve shifted down. Okay. Now notice that if you integrate this curve, then on the left-hand side, the rate of change of the wage share integrated is roughly equal to the log of the wage share, uh, and, uh, which is a constant plus some integral of the persistent gap between actual unemployment and normal unemployment. So that's a cumulative pressure of unemployment. And that is actually very similar 
to what is called the Blanche Flower Oswald wage curve. Um, more than one person in this department have done their dissertation on the Blanche Flower Oswald wage curve. The idea being that Blanche Flower and Oswald point, argued that there's a great deal of empirical evidence that the log of the wage is negatively related to unemployment. And that would happen perfectly naturally from this relationship. And uh, the citations are there. You can look them up. Whoops. What happened here? Well, um, ignoring the fact that, oh, there it is. <laughs> For some reason, when I move on to this page, as soon as I move on to the page, the, the axis, the right-hand axis disappears. If I'm not on the page, it's here. Hang on. See it there at the top of the curve, right under figure. As I move down, it disappears. <laughs> I think I can make it come back. Anyway, so this is the classical, what I call the classical curve, which is the rate of change of wage share on the top, which is my uh, little uh, variable, what is it, omega. And on the horizontal axis, this is unemployment rate. And for some reason, uh, I have no idea why, it won't let me see that. Well, I give up. Yeah, OK, I got it. Mysteries of computers. So here's the rate of change of the wage share, unemployment rate. Here's the classical curve. And here's the point at which the rate of change of the wage share is 0. Now, it doesn't follow that the system is going to settle there. We have to establish all of that. But at least there is. And you notice how similar this is to a Phillips curve. We can arrive at the idea of a classical curve. And so we have two elements, an endogenous savings rate, and now a classical curve. And we need to link these two. But you can see the link. If this is the rate of change of the wage share, and it's moving this way, then the rate of change of the profit share is the inverse of that. And if their technology is given in the sense of the constant uh, for provisionally a capital output ratio, then you're essentially saying that uh, as you move in this region here, rate of wage change of the wage share is positive, so the profit rate is falling. In this region, the rate of change of the wage share is negative, so the profit rate is rising. So here, this space is a falling profit rate, and this space is a rising profit rate at given technology due to the interaction between unemployment wages and hence profitability, and hence growth. And you notice that, how similar that is to the argument in Goodwin and in Marx. So I'm going to close that other half of this next time to show that you can little by little formalize it, and then you get a system in which Goodwin is a special case, but you get all the classical argument, growth driven by profitability, uh, persistent rate of unemployment, which is normal, which the system comes back to. And then we can talk about pumping up economy, uh, what you will see is that in actual US economy, it starts off here in 1947 and moves down this way. And then the Vietnam War comes, and it moves straight up the same curve. And the Vietnam War boom dies out. It comes back down. It takes 13 years to traverse the same curve going there. And then it continues down, and it hits around in 1977, around here, it hits uh, uh, 80, uh, 1980 hits Reagan, Thatcher, and the curve literally blows up and then shifts down to another curve. And that means the strength of labor is shifted down. And you can see it literally uh, year by year along two curves for the whole post-war period from 1947 to 2014.